There's never been a greater risk of terror, and it's getting greater. But as the threat grows, are security strategies keeping up? And are they actually keeping us safe? Also on today's program, an end to Japan's pacifist past. For the first time since World War II, Japan can legally fight battles overseas. And in picture this, killing the Great Barrier Reef, how climate change is damaging the world's largest coral ecosystem. Hello and welcome to The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. It's a challenge faced by nearly every country in the world, finding a balance between keeping its citizens safe and keeping their civil liberties safe. Edward Snowden's revelations about the extent of spying by U.S. authorities angered both its allies and its citizens. But according to the Global Terrorism Index, there's never been a higher threat of terrorism. And that risk, they say, is rising year on year. So where do governments draw the line? And how do they combat the threat posed by terror groups, networks, cells and so-called lone wolves? Today's newsmaker is Global Security as we ask if our governments are fighting a losing battle. Bringing the latest on the ongoing hostage situation in Cyprus. Threatening passengers with a suicide belt. How someone got on board an aircraft with a, a belt that they claim has explosives. We are dealing with the situation in order to save the lives of the passengers. Egypt Air Flight Imis 181 hijacked and forced to divert to Cyprus. Egyptian CF Alden Mustafa took over the plane, claiming to be wearing a suicide belt. We are not sure whether what he has is a true uh, bump or, or, or threat to the aircraft, but we are dealing with it as a real threat because we cannot take any risks. After a six-hour standoff and all the hostages released, he surrendered. It's the second airline security breach in Egypt in the last six months. In November, Daesh claimed responsibility for planting a bomb on a passenger plane in Sinai, killing all 224 people on board. Since 9-11, airport security has been ramped up. And yet these attackers can still slip through. Or the airport itself becomes a target. It's been one week since the Belgian capital was sent into lockdown. At least 35 people were killed by suicide bombers at Zaventem Airport Departures Terminal and at Malbec Metro Station near the European Union headquarters. Questions remain over how this was able to happen. Belgium had been on high alert and Turkish authorities had warned Belgium about one of the bombers. Europe's Schengen zone and a lack of information sharing have been highlighted as the major challenges to preventing further attacks in Europe. In December, the EU Commission said members had to share the passenger name record of those travelling around Europe. But Europe's Human Rights Court has ruled this would violate passengers' privacy. Terrorism has increasingly become a threat that knows no borders. Recent attacks across the world have been carried out by lone wolves or on soft targets several of these in the last month. March the 13th, gunmen from Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb opened fire in Grand Basim, Ivory Coast. At least 18 people were killed. On March the 19th, a suicide bomber attacked Istanbul's main shopping street. At least five people were killed in the attack. The bomber had links to Daesh. Iskandaria in central Iraq, March the 25th. At least 32 people were killed by a suicide bomber at a football match. Daesh claimed responsibility for the attack. And on Sunday, a suicide attack in Lahore, Pakistan. A suicide bomber attacked a park popular with families. More than 70 people were killed and at least 300 injured by the blast. With such deadly attacks in public places, questions are being raised about whether political and intelligence efforts can really protect against such attacks and whether focusing security in one area creates blind spots in others. Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. 
Well, joining me now to discuss whether global security strategy is failing is Kyle Orton in Liverpool. He's a senior fellow at the Henry Jackson Society. In London is Sari Bullivant. He's a filmmaker and human rights activist at Cage UK. He spent two years living under a UK control order before being exonerated. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Kyle Orton, let me start with you. Are we losing this Thanks, battle Ali. against global terror? No, there's not really a loss or a victory to be had, but it's at this point terrorism seems to have an advantage and the security services have been caught slightly off balance and the scale of the problem is certainly challenging them, but it will be corrected in due course. Why are you so optimistic that it will be corrected? In the, they can't, I mean, ISIS cannot control territory in the West in the way it can, say, in the Middle East. Uh, in Europe, obviously, the challenge is a lot more grievous because it's much more embedded in communities as well as within networks. So you do have a larger pool of people prepared to carry out terrorism. And it is something more like low-level guerrilla warfare in places. But it will be, eventually, the, the authorities will find a way to, to cope with it and contain it. Siri, if more surveillance and a, suspe a suspension of some civil liberties stopped another Brussels, another Istanbul, another Paris, would you be for them? Well, we've been trying to it's up the ante with security, our security measures. and bring in more and more measures for the last 14 years um, of the war on terror. We've, uh, we've taken this highly securitized approach, and that isn't what's keeping us safe. As you said at the beginning of your report, we're in more danger now than we ever have been. So maybe we need some clear blue sky thinking about this, to come at it from an approach that will actually um, uh, make us safer, and instead of ramping up the rhetoric with low-level guerrilla warfare. I mean, really. OK, what is it then, Siri? What we see is that if you look at the, the problem in, in the security approach that we're taking, it's based largely on academic uh, theories like um, uh, the conveyor belt theory, which have been discredited and disproven. And this idea that the, the threat is all, all amongst these Muslim communities um, is one that's creating damaging policy, such as the prevent policy, which is actually only going to make the problem worse and alienate more people and push people out of, out of feeling British, out of feeling that they, they're part of this society and part of this community at a time when we need to be coming together, not pushing people away. OK, but Sari, how would you have dealt with a place like Molenbeek differently, given that so much destruction has come out of it in Paris and in Brussels. Surely something like a prevent strategy might have helped Molenbeek, right? Well, France has the, uh, the, the most strict um, anti-terror legislation. It has some of the um, harshest laws in regards to all of these issues. Um, and it actually has the harshest laws in, in regards to um, sort of curtailing um, Islamic uh, way of life, for example, women not being allowed to wear hijab in, uh, in schools and colleges, um, banning the niqab, as it's been done in both Brussels and in France. None of these things have made them any safer. Does that justify people blowing up civilians? No one's justifying anything here. We're talking about what works, what's going to keep us safe, and what's best practice. And if it's best practice, to take a new approach after 15 years of trying this approach and it not working, then I think it's best practice for us, for our safety, to do the right thing and take a new approach at, at these problems. OK, so what is the new approach and what, what is the blue sky thinking? Give me one example. Firstly, stop criminalizing the entire Muslim community as if this is a problem that is only embedded within the Muslims. We just recently, uh, in the last week, had a, a, a Christian convicted of war crimes and genocide against, uh, against Muslims. No one said that that was a Christian problem. They didn't look at it through that lens because we're looking at the, uh, the problem of terrorism through the lens of Islam rather than through the lens of political violence, which is what it is. Okay. Um, secondly, we need to take an approach that's inclusive and uses the Muslim community um, as an ally rather than treating them as the enemy. Kyle Orton, does any of that sound reasonable to you? Uh, he's certainly right. The Muslim community is its the greatest barrier against terrorism. You, can't, you could not solve this problem without the cooperation of the Muslim community. Uh, but the problem with the approach taken and outlined there is that 
uh, it is within these communities that the problem is arising. I mean, you can point to what's happened in Bosnia, but this was 15 years ago, and within a very specific context of the breakdown of former Yugoslavia. Uh, the problem currently of jihadi Salafism, which is the strand of Islam that's giving rise to this terrorism, it is a problem within their ideology and within those communities, and there's no point in denying that that's where the problem is coming from. Among other things, it's not going to be solved if you try and look elsewhere for it. Siri? Well, I, I think that if you look to uh, the works of uh, Professor Aaron Kunani from NYU, uh, even Professor Mark Sageman, who was ex-CIA from America, he completely discredits this. We've had people going off to join ISIS who were buying Islam for dummies two weeks before they, before they were leaving. So this isn't something that's enshrined within Salafi jihadism and, and this ideological uh, principle. This is as it was with um, the, the Irish troubles, as it was with many other incidents of, 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 of terrorism, political violence, and the causes are political. We need to take an approach that recognizes that rather than trying to criminalize a community um, for their beliefs. Okay, but Sarir, would you agree that in addition to all of that, Daesh still has to be defeated on the battlefield. They need to be defeated militarily. So all of these other things can be taking place. But on the ground, you have a bunch of people beheading uh, people they consider non-Muslims, beheading journalists and others. Would you agree that they have to be defeated militarily as well? I think everybody agrees that a Daesh needs to be uh, uh, destroyed and gotten rid of. Um, they're, they're doing attacks. Uh, and they kill far more Muslims than, it, than anybody else anyway. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that even um, uh, the, the most um, horrific and sort of the, the, bad, uh, the bad boogie guy before, Al-Qaeda, want to destroy a Daesh. There's literally no disagreement on that. Kyle, if you consider one of the Brussels attackers, Bekrawi, was deported by Turkey for being connected to ISIS, the Belgians let him free. Do you think, Kyle, would you agree that there is no network at the moment, both on the sort of ground level and in terms of the intelligence agencies not cooperating with each other? Okay. Yes, that certainly does seem to be true. Especially in Europe, it's the problem of you had open borders between states, but you didn't have coordination between the security services. And in Belgium, you have six separate government entities, and they don't even coordinate with each other. Uh, so that's definitely problematic. I should say to your other guest that he's right that Al-Qaeda, among others, is also opposed to ISIS. That's in some sense the problem. Um, Al-Qaeda is being able to rebrand itself as, as against ISIS and make itself seem more mainstream and reasonable. And that's why the ideology is important to factor in, because that's Al-Qaeda's ideology too. It's a tactical distinction that they're acting differently at the moment. What about the They're still the enemy. Yeah. They're just yeah. acting in a more cautious way. Yeah. In a pragmatic way. What about the technical difficulties in um, tackling an enemy that doesn't really have a geography? As you and Siri have mentioned, you know, they, they operate all over the world. They have franchises all over the world. I mean, for example, in a place like India, there's a Maoist insurgency, Kyle. It has a very specific location in the jungles of sort of eastern central uh, India, right? Um, how do you tackle a meme? Yes and a fan club around the world, and especially since they seem to be um, using all sorts of asymmetric methods nowadays, whereas they're not attacking the, the safe zone within airplanes anymore or past the security point. They're, just ta they're, they're attacking where people congregate before they go through the security checks. And they're constantly in this arms race adapting their strategies. Is it always going to be this arms race? There will be, it will be a very long-term uh, contest. With the Islamic State, it's much easier because they have chosen to stake their legitimacy on capturing territory. So once their territory is rolled back and destroyed, they're finished as well. Uh, Al-Qaeda is much more difficult at the moment because it's trying to embed itself within insurgent dynamics in countries like Syria and Yemen. Uh, but it too is ultimately looking to hold territory. And as it tries to actually tighten its grip on territories, as it did in Idlib recently, and it cracked down on other groups, it does spark a backlash. 
I mean, the, these groups are opposed by most Muslims in the world, so they will be fought when they try to impose themselves. But they also do have a lot of power at the moment, so they have to, their opposition has to be empowered to fight them. Sarib, faced with all these multiple threats, in your eyes, is there any government doing it right? I think actually there, there are um, a, a, a lot of governments sadly doing it wrong. I think there are, there are some governments that um, are sort of taking a more nuanced approach. Um, Qatar in many cases is um, doing a lot of things right. Not everything. Um, and Turkey as well um, seems to be making some right moves, but they're in a very, very difficult position at the moment. If you had to be at the table and they called you in, to advise them on how to deal with Daesh terrorism, what would you say in one sentence, Siri? In one sentence, gosh. Um, fix the world's problems in one sentence. I think that we, what we need to do is um, change the, the method at which we're using to, uh, to move the dialogue forward uh, in terms of with the, the communities around the world and work with the people on the ground um, and empower uh, the actual people who can m realistically make a difference against Daesh um, on the ground, rather than just purely supporting people that um, play into our narrative. Who are the people, uh, Siri, that can realistically make a difference? It, it's going to mean working with some people that we, that we, do, we don't like. Um, and some of that may be, uh, may be um, some of the other Islamic movements, um, obviously not Jabhat al-Nusra, but some of the other groups um, from the Islamic Front uh, who actually have more people on the ground and, and, and more uh, ability um, to do damage to Daesh than, for example, the FSA, which is largely just passing weapons along anyway. OK. We have run out of time. Time is not our friend here. But, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. I've got to move on to another segment, but thanks again. Still to come on the Newsmakers, we ask what Japan's new self-defense laws mean to the Pacific region. And in picture this, the images reveal the rate of destruction of Australia's Great Barrier Reef. A reinterpretation of the Japanese constitution has come into force, allowing the country to legally deploy its military for the first time since World War II. It's a controversial move that's pitted the government against not only its domestic opponents, but also China. But is it necessary? The newsmaker Soraya Lenny has this report. Japan's army is transforming. It's not popular, but according to the government, it's necessary. For more than half a century, Japan has been limited to self-defense, but the new changes would legally allow Japanese troops to fight overseas in defense of its allies for the first time since World War II. The basis of security lies in resolutely ensuring the nation's safety and protecting the life, freedom and happiness of the people of Japan under any condition. Technically, Japan has broken with its pacifist post-war past. In 2004, Tokyo sent 1,000 troops to help the US-led occupation of Iraq, but not in combat. You, going to help with reconstruction and humanitarian work in Iraq, are not going to war. You are not using military force. You are going to help the people of Iraq in their hopes to rebuild their country. Detractors say the new law will allow Japan to support its allies in illegal wars. From aggressor to pacifist, after its defeat in World War II, Japan renounced all its military capabilities. It would become enshrined in law. Japan's constitution states it will never again maintain land, sea or air forces or other war potential. Under the terms of a security pact with the United States, US forces in Japan agreed to deal with external aggression, while Japanese forces would deal with internal threats. But as the Korean War broke out and a large number of US occupying forces left the country, 
Japan was basically defenseless. It prompted the establishment of a strengthened police force and later a defense force in 1954. Across Asia, military spending is increasing, mostly in response to China's military buildup. Though Beijing outspends Japan five to one on arms, it's angry at its regional rival. Japan's Asian neighbors and the international community are concerned about this issue due to historical reasons. In regard to Japan's moves in military and security affairs, we hope that the Japanese side would draw lessons from history and stick to the path of peaceful development. A change to the Japanese law strengthens its alliance with Washington, and that's a worry for China, and means that Tokyo can assist the US and its allies, even if Japan is not under attack. Now that street runs both ways, regardless of whether the Japanese people want it to. Soraya Leni, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now to discuss Japan's new defense policy is Corey Wallace. He's a security policy analyst at Berlin's Free University School of Asian Studies and has spent several years living in Japan. Thanks a lot for joining us, uh, Mr. Wallace. Um, this pacifist constitution... Hello. Is it basically seen as one of the post... Uh, created by the post-World War II U.S. occupation and a constitution of humiliation, and that's why we're seeing Japan move in this new direction? Well, th that uh, sort of narrative um, certainly was the case uh, after World War II for a lot of the conservatives in Japan. Um, however, I think over time, this sort of idea of the constitution being a imposed or a sort of a form of hum humiliation for Japan, depriving it of autonomy and independence, is no longer really um, embraced by most people, most of the elites, most of the public, there is a small section that still sees it that way. Um, mainly because the Japanese themselves more or less embraced the constitution, um, especially in the 1950s once the Korean War broke out and uh, the US occupation left. Censorship was lifted, they revisited the, the war and what happened, they had a debate and they sort of came to a conclusion that actually taking a low profile approach based on Article 9 was not an unreasonable thing to do. So, uh, you know, if, if the Japanese were so keen to get rid of this constitution, there was am ample opportunities to do so over the last 60-odd uh, years or so. So, um, you know, there are some people in Japan, and you know, Prime Minister Abe, to some degree, uh, sees Japan's autonomy restricted by the constitution, for sure. But I don't think that's necessarily the... Uh, most salient aspect of this debate. Mm -hmm. How big is that fear of China and North Korea? Is it a real, visceral, tangible fear within Japan amongst the population? Uh, over the last five years, it has uh, started to change, I've certainly noticed. Uh, beforehand, there were always tensions, but there was a general sense amongst the public and uh, a lot of the elites that, you know, China could be managed, um, you know, Relations wouldn't necessarily be good, but they could be managed and not become hostile. Uh, a lot of people are actually starting to lose confidence in that uh, conviction. And that is why that, uh, you know, no, nobody really seriously thinks China's going to attack the Japan Japanese mainland, but uh, the maritime sort of commons around Japan, you know, uh, obviously there's the Ten Senkaku Islands, there's the East China Sea, maybe even Okinawa. So there are some who are starting to wonder whether um, Chinese military projection will create problems for Japan in the future. And that's basically what this legislation is about, even though Japan uh, is trying to avoid saying so in public. Corey Wallace, excellent to talk to you. Thank you very much for joining us. In today's picture, this environmentalists have renewed calls for Australia's Great Barrier Reef to be added to the list of endangered World Heritage Sites after new images showed that the reefs are in a far worse state than previously thought. Let's take a look.
Today's newsmaker has been global security in the face of a growing threat of terrorism. We asked how governments could balance civil liberties with national security. The answer shifts and changes with our perceptions of government and governance, and whether anyone or anything should have the legitimacy to intrude on our personal lives in the interests of keeping us safe. If so, to what extent? And if that power is abused, what then? You've been watching this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. As always, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.